<clears throat> Unfortunately, there was a great deal of animosity that existed in the early church between Jewish and Gentile Christians that had to be overcome. One aspect of this animosity stemmed from the sense of moral superiority that was evidenced by some of the Jewish people against Gentile Christians. They exhibited a measure of spiritual elitism as descendants of Abraham and having lifelong commitments to the law of God. In Romans chapter 2, verse 17, it says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. There was this boasting in their relationship to God that had to be addressed and needs to be addressed in our lives as well. If we have a sense of self-accomplishment or self-achievement in our salvation. Just a review since we haven't been in Romans for a period of time now. In Romans chapter 2 verse 17, it says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. Their boasting, their relationship to God is found in verses 18 and following. They boasted in this way and know his will and approve what is excellent because you were instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So they, they view themselves as having this great knowledge and truth and ready to teach and instruct others. But that calling to, that uh, boasting is called into question in verses 2, 21 to 23. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You abhor idols. Do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. And notice in verse 23 the word boast. You who boast in the law, boast in confidence in their relationship to God's law. Do you in fact actually dishonor God by breaking the law. So the conclusion is that the Jews were no better than the Gentiles, Romans 3, 9. What then? Are the Jews better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. All needed to be saved by grace, Romans 3, 21 to 23. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this morning, we look at the application of this truth, and it comes in verse 27. Then what becomes of boasting? What happens with boasting? They had been boasting about their relationship to God and the law. So what happens to boasting? Verse 27, it is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. We find out that faith rules out any possibility of boasting in any personal achievement or merit in having a relationship to God. Why? Because a person is declared righteous not on the basis of one's obedience to, to the law, but on the basis of faith. Romans 3.28 For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The word justified means to declare righteous. We are declared righteous not as a result of our works, our goodness, our obedience, but solely on the faith of in Jesus Christ. Christ. It was important to understand that justification was always by faith and not by works. 
Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So the Old Testament taught the same thing. The proof that no one has any reason to boast in their salvation as being based on works is now illustrated in two individuals. That is Abraham and David. So this morning we look at these two examples to demonstrate that it is impossible to boast about one's relationship to God based on works. We are saved not by works, but by faith. The first illustration is that Abraham did not have any grounds of boasting before God because he was justified by faith. <clears throat> so Romans 4.1 begins with a question. What should we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Now when it says Abraham according to the flesh, it means Abraham, their physical father. Abraham by descent. We're going to find out that Abraham is the father of all those who believe. Uh, that's going to come next week. But this morning it's addressing the Jewish people and it's saying our father according to the flesh, our, our father based on human descendants, as we think about our ancestor Abraham, and they all prided themselves in being sons of Abraham, the question is, well, how was Abraham declared righteous? On what basis was Abraham brought into a relationship with God? Was it by works or was it by faith? The premise is, if Abraham were justified by works, then he had grounds for boasting. If Abraham would have been declared righteous based on his good deeds or his actions or his obedience, then he could have been puffed up, then he could have bragged, then he could have said, look at me, look at what I have achieved. I have a relationship to God because of my goodness. Notice Romans 4, 2. If Abraham were justified by works, he has something to boast about. And then it says this, but not before God. Well, why couldn't he boast before God? Answer, because his works were unacceptable. Back to Romans 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Abraham was a sinner. So he had no basis to boast before God about his righteousness because he was not righteous. However, Abraham was not justified by works, but rather by faith, Romans 4, 3. For what does the scripture say? We've already said that in Romans 3, 21, it says these things were attested to by the law and the prophets. So now there is this appeal to scripture. Well, what does the scripture say? On what basis was Abraham declared righteous? Romans 4, 3. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now that verse becomes the foundation for all of chapter 4. There are three sections to Romans chapter 4. And this verse is going to be cited as the proof text for each of these three sections. The first, the one that we're in, Romans 4, 3. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. The next section starts with Romans 4, 9. Is this blessing then only for the circumcision or also for the uncircumcision? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. And the third section starts with Romans 4.22. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. So three times 
this particular verse is cited. So it's a very important verse. But I'm not going to go back to Genesis 15, 6 and look at that this morning. I'm going to save that for a future date when we get to Romans chapter 4, verses 22 and following. This morning, we simply point out that there's this citation that Abraham was justified by his belief. Now, we have a very important word in the ESV, starting at verse 3, and it's the word counted. If you notice, it appears in every verse, from verse 3 through verse 6. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed and was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the one blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. This word to count or to consider or to impute or to credit is actually a financial term. It is a legal term. It speaks of giving credit to an account, an account that is in the rears, an account that uh, has a deficit. And the deficit that's in view here is righteousness. Uh, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We fail to have the righteousness that we need. And so this faith is counted, it's applied to the debt so that our sins can be forgiven, that is remitted, that is removed, that is that they're not held against us anymore. We have a clean slate as a result of faith in Jesus Christ. That's the thought. And if a person is justified by works, he has earned his salvation. His wages are deposited in his account as being owed to that person. Notice verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but is due. All right? That's what he is owed. If a person is going to be uh, working, then the fruit of his labor is not a gift. It's what he's owed. We expect that a person who has worked hard all week, at the end of the week, gets a paycheck. You get paid at the end of the week or month or whatever the payment schedule is because you have earned it. You don't thank your employer for this incredible gift that you just received because it's not a gift. You deserve it. You worked for it. You achieved it. It's owed to you. And on that basis, you have something to boast in. You can say, I worked hard this week. I earned my paycheck. I did a good job. I was faithful. I was, I was diligent. I was to work on time. I deserve this amount of money. And you may even think you deserve more than what you got because of how hard you worked. And so there's this reason to boast. But if we are declared righteous on the basis of faith, then righteousness is not earned. It's a gift. And if it's a gift, there's no reason to boast. That's Romans 4 or 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, it's very important to note that it is expressly stated that faith is not a work. Look at Romans 4 or 5. And to the one, and now this is the important phrase, who does not work. But, okay, here's a strong conversive. The person who does not work but, antithesis, believes. All right? So right there, you find out that faith is not a work, meaning meritorious, meaning something of which we have something to boast in, something that we can take credit for, something that we can say, we earned our salvation because we had faith. No. 
No. Faith is a gift. It is not earned. Now that's going to be developed in much more length uh, later uh, in the book of Romans, but it's very important for us to understand that this morning, that faith is not a work. So that faith is not meritorious. We don't deserve to be saved because of our faith, but rather our faith even is a gift from God, and therefore we can't claim ourselves to be something special because of our faith. Faith is counted as righteousness. Righteousness is a gift given by God, received by faith. Notice verse 4. Now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. So when we get salvation by faith, it's not our due, it's not what is owed to us, but it's a free gift. It is something that is handed over to us regardless of what we have done. It is not a result of our merit, our earning it. So let's go back and look at the bigger context again, back to Romans 3.21 and following. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, for there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there is this universal need of salvation. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, and are justified, that is declared righteous, by his grace as a gift. Okay, grace is unmerited favor. You don't deserve this gift. You're not owed this gift. No one can say that God had to save me. That it was somehow required on God's part because of something that I had done or something even that existed in the very character of God that he had to save me. He didn't. One of the great ways in which we can understand that God was under no moral necessity to save any of us is that he hasn't provided salvation for any of the angels. The angels are higher than us, but God did not make it possible for one single angel to be saved. Those that have fallen are going to be forever condemned, forever judged, forever tormented. There is no salvation for angels, but there is salvation for human beings. That is a gracious act of God. No necessity on God's part and so salvation is an absolute gift that is given. Not as a reward, not as a payment, not as a result of anything that we have done to merit it, but solely as a gift. So righteousness is not a result of works. Faith is not a work or meritorious gift, uh, meritorious, but in fact is a gift. Thus, there is no grounds for boasting. That is the consistent thought of this passage. This is a consistent thought of the scriptures. It is why we used as our call to worship this morning, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there is no grounds for anyone to view themselves as morally superior to someone else, simply because we're saved. For our salvation is not based on moral superiority. Our salvation is not based on anything that we can personally take credit for. There is absolutely no reason why I should be saved over 
another person. And there is absolutely no reason in your own character as to why you should be saved over any other person. That's humbling. But it has to be understood as absolutely true. There is no distinguishing characteristic in us. There is no grounds for boasting. That's the example of of Abraham. Then it appears to David. David, of course, is another great ancestor of the Jewish people. Uh, He is the former king of Israel. David is held in high regard. So then the question is, well, what about David? Well, David did not boast in the righteousness that came as a result of works. Notice Romans 4, 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. So David is cited as another example of a person who is viewed to be righteous apart from his good deeds. Next, we have a quotation that comes from Psalm 32, Romans 4, 7, and 8. Blessed, this is how David viewed himself, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. As I said, this is a citation of Psalm 32. Psalm 32 was written out of David's having committed uh, sin in having committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba and then after committing adultery with Bathsheba and not wanting his sin to be found out, he ultimately has her husband killed so that he can cover up his sin. David talks about it in the beginning of Psalm 32. when he says that day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture was turned to the drought of summer, say law, I acknowledge my iniquity unto thee and my, my sin I'm not hidden. I said I'll confess my transgression unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The point is here that David was a sinner. David I committed adultery. David had committed murder. So why would David be rewarded with salvation who was an adulterer and was a murderer? And the answer was, he wasn't. He wasn't rewarded for his adultery. He wasn't rewarded for his murder. His life was not placed on a balance. It was not his good deeds viewed against his bad deeds. And if the good deeds outweighed the bad deeds, that he'd be saved. That's not how salvation works. It's not based on our deeds at all. It's not based on our merit. It's not based on how good we are. Our salvation is based solely on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins. And if we recognize our sinfulness, if we accept his sacrifice, his having died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and rise again and, and rose again for our justification, then we are saved. Not because of any goodness in us, but because of the grace and mercy and goodness of God. We cannot say anything except how blessed we are. How fortunate we are. How graced we are. And and we stand amazed that God, you would save me. You would send your son to die for me. You would give me faith. You would bring me to yourself. God, I am blessed. Not, oh God, I have earned this. 
Oh, look at me. Oh, recognize how holy and righteous and good I am. No, not at all. Not at all. So David speaks of this blessedness that comes not as a result of works, but rather despite his works. Notice Romans 4, 7 and 8 again. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. It is not sin that's applied to his count. It's righteousness that's applied to his count. That application to his count is not deeds. It is the righteousness that comes from God through faith. The point is Old Testament, New Testament. A person is not saved by their own moral lifestyle. A person is saved by the grace and goodness of God solely on the basis of Jesus' death and resurrection that we accept by faith. The point being, the application is, first, there is no reason for any of us to feel morally superior to anyone else. We are not saved because we're better than other people in any way. We have no right to look down our nose at anyone. We are not saved because we are wiser than other people. We're not saved because we are more intelligent than other people. We can't say, you know, at least I had enough sense to realize that I was a sinner and needed forgiveness. Faith is a gift. You can't even take credit for the faith that you have. But it's given you by God. So, there is no merit of any sort on any of our parts. So there is another application that comes all the way back to Romans chapter one. And this is really an unfolding of that. So if you turn back to your Bibles, to Romans chapter one, starting in verse 14. Starting with verse 14, it says, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Paul said there is an obligation, there's a duty that I have to take the gospel to everyone, whether they are Greek or barbarian. That is, whether they are cultured or whether they are a heathen, whether they dress nice, whether they have good behavior, or whether they're dressed awful, they are bums, they are the scum of society. Whether they are wise or whether they're fools, whether they're the most learned or the most ignorant. For salvation comes to all. Salvation is given regardless of your social status, regardless of your religious history, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your IQ, regardless of your education, regardless of anything that human beings have a tendency to pride themselves in. Salvation is offered to all who will believe. Therefore, we have an obligation to take the gospel to all who believe. 
and a large part of the conclusion of Romans is, therefore, we have the responsibility to accept all who believe. That we have a responsibility to fellowship with them. That we have a responsibility to welcome them. That we have a responsibility of taking them in and being a part of us because they're no different from us. Because we are one of them. We should not be ashamed to associate ourselves with anyone. And we should not be ashamed of the gospel. Look at Romans 1, 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm proud of the gospel, not myself. The, the gospel is for everyone who believes. to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that is from beginning to end, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So here is this first concluding application. Therefore, we have no grounds for boasting. If you are here this morning and you have any relationship with God, it's solely because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross. And none of us can claim any merit. And let me just say to you this morning, if you desire to be saved, if you desire to be in the presence with God, if you desire to know him more fully, if you desire to be accepted of God, it's not going to be on the basis of your merit, of your goodness, of your obedience. The only acceptance that we can have with God is through Jesus Christ. Without him, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So this morning I offer to you the free gift of salvation that comes solely through faith in Jesus Christ. This morning, if you want to be right with God, accept his gift which was given when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again, so that our sins could be forgiven and we could enjoy peace with God. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do that this morning. And if you have placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, how blessed we are. How blessed we are. Our only response should be, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. I don't deserve it. I hope this morning that you can say wholeheartedly and sincerely, I'm saved, but I don't deserve it. Isn't God good? Let us pray. Our Father, we, we pray this morning and we certainly pray if there's anyone here who has never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I pray that this morning would be that day when they would say, I need forgiveness for my sin, for I'm different, no different than anyone else, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. May we have the humility, may you grant to us that humility, may you grant to us that faith to accept how you evaluate us, and that is that we're sinners. We have done things that we shouldn't have done. We failed to do things that we should have done. And if there's anyone here this morning that would like to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, would you just quickly raise your hand and put it up high enough so I can see it? I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but I want to be aware of that. Uh, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but if you would like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, would you raise your hand quickly so I can see it? Keep it up until I recognize it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to really fully embrace this great truth that we have no grounds for boasting. We are saved not because of some unique quality within us. There is nothing that uh, distinguishes us from someone else, not our ethnicity, not our background, not who our parents are, 
not anything. Not how smart we are, not how good we are, not how thin we are, not how whatever it is. But Lord, we are saved solely by grace through faith. Thank you. And thank you for that gift of faith. Um, help us to, to praise and to honor and glorify you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.